brother were like, we just got out of the shower and uh, he was about two years younger than me. And while my mom was like taking care of him because he's like tiny, I was like in the living room drying off watching TV. Whoever the newscaster was starts kind of getting my attention. Chris. Saying like, hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. And it's saying, don't, don't worry. worry. Everything's going to be OK. And one day, we'll be back. It terrified me. I remember screaming to get my mom bring her to the TV who now was back to doing like normal newscasting because that's you know what it was and her basically explaining to me like TVs don't talk to you that's ridiculous I'm disenchanted because now I thought something really cool happened and that's not a thing I remember I know it was there um, and you know I was I was wide awake I had literally just got out of the shower and it was this very overwhelming experience for me because now as a five-year-old, I, I didn't know where I <laughs> belonged. So how did this start, Jeff? Um, probably about 10 years ago. I was my girlfriend at the time and I we were talking about just different paranormal stories and she started telling me about me about how sometimes she would wake up in the middle of the night just like unable to move or breathe and she said it felt like there's like an evil presence in the room with her. And that it would just like kind of like torment her and then she would eventually wake up and it'd be like it was just a dream. And after she told me that, I didn't really know what to make of it. I was like, okay, I, get, I got involved with some crazy girl. And I just kind of changed the subject, started talking about something else. And then about a week later, I laid down to go to sleep. And just as I started to drift off, I felt my body just become extremely heavy. And it was like, I fell asleep but then woke up at like the same instant and just my whole body started tingling it felt like really weighted down like something was pulling me and I heard this like sound it wasn't like outside of my head but it was just like inside of my head it just sounded like a wash machine just kind of like out of balance or something just like banging against the wall and it just really terrified me kind of started like freaking out and like started seeing things and just really bizarre. What did you see? Um, it's kind of like, it was, it's kind of like all these different colors, like a laser light show or something, or like I was like flying through like a time warp. I just had all these like colors just like shooting at me and lights and stuff. had found that I had zero control over my body. Like, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't move my arms, my legs, or nothing. And so I really I started to kind of have like a panic attack because I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was dead. I thought it was like a stroke or something. <laughs> nothing worked. I couldn't move. I had no control over anything. And finally, I decided, well, I'm just going to try to build up all the strength that I have in me just to get myself to roll over onto my girlfriend, hoping that it wakes her up. So it was just like this last ditch effort of everything I had, I just like wrenched my body. As soon as I like flipped over on top of her, I woke up. 
and I was still laying in my original position, like none of it had happened. It was just completely shocked. I had no idea what was going on. I just did not know what to make of it. After that, it was like constantly night after night after night for a couple weeks, maybe even a month or so. Just did not know how to process it at the time. <laughs> so finally, I told my girlfriend about it. I was like, okay, this is what's happening to me. I think I need to go to the doctor. I think I'm having strokes, like mini strokes or seizures maybe even. And she's like, no, that's exactly what happens to me. And it's like, that's what I was trying to tell you about. I was about uh, 29 years old. Mm -hmm. And here in this room, um, as I would lay down to sleep, I'd start feeling tingling in my feet, and then it, I would feel it rise up my legs, up my torso, and my hands, and I'd also hear buzzing, you know, like bees buzzing. That's when these episodes would start. I would feel tingling, and I would get, not my feel the energy. I felt that my mind was awake, but my body was stiff. I'd try to move my head from side to side. I just, I couldn't move. that moment, I would hear tapping on the window. Right they would tap here. I would hear tapping. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just a squirrel or a raccoon. But it was like a pattern. It was definitely a knock. And I would open my eyes, and I'd look toward the window, and then it would stop. But after a while, I started feeling an actual presence. And I would feel this presence right next to me trying to take my soul out. It would torture me at night, and I would try and fight it. But I felt I was, my body felt paralyzed. It was just so strong that I would just let go. And then I'd feel myself floating in the air. And I could try and see myself, but I would just see a blur. Um, and it happened for many years. And um, when I was pregnant with my daughter, and I felt the baby as well trying to come out, but I was trying to fight it. And I was saying, no, no. So I would pull back. It's like if I would pull back and it would pull, you know, the other way. When I was in my mid to late twenties, I had a really awful breakup. I was miserable because I was like so brokenhearted, and I started my first teaching job around the same time, so I was super stressed out from that. I would just see this like dark figure by the bookshelves, and I like could not move, and it was fucking terrifying. I didn't know what was happening. I did think that somebody had broken into my apartment at first because at that point my roommate and I lived, um, I had a roommate then, like we lived on 4th Street and we were on the top floor of the building and our building was really easy to get into. Like the door in from the balcony to like our apartment didn't really lock and us. So I think I was like, oh fuck, somebody actually broke in. To be lying there and like, no, I want to move and I'm trying to move and I cannot, absolutely terrifying. I've always had a problem with states of consciousness, slipping in and out of different states of consciousness. And I do remember when I was very, very young, two, three, I was still in a crib. And there was a plug-in nightlight, and it was that orange cast color. And um, it was all dark except for that orange cast and the room turned red, and I felt like something was coming after me, and I cuddled down and covered myself. It was 
my earliest memory of the scariness that happened to me and continued to happen. Laying down to go to sleep, I would feel utterly exhausted, almost as if I had just been drugged. I mean, you know, haven't been in the hospital. I understand what that's like. It's just like I had been injected. And my eyes sealed shut, my mouth sealed shut, and it's as if everything was shutting down except for my awareness, my consciousness. And then I could feel a vibration. Um, sometimes it was so intense it felt like being electrocuted, but it was definitely an electrical vibration. I began hearing voices and screams and crying and all of this really emotional drama, yelling to crying, but all negative emotion, all of these different voices. And then that is when the shadow man would come toward me. And he looked just like a three-dimensional shadow, uh, outline, just perfect. And he would walk disjointed. And he brought the vibration with him. It's as if it was emanating from him. And he would come towards me and I would just feel that here, here. I would hear all the sounds of hell. I don't know any other way to put it and feel his awful vibration. And I would have a fight flight response. And I would completely, you know, freak out and try to scream or get away. And many times the intensity just continued. And I was very scared and I was, I was upstairs and I didn't feel like anybody was gonna get to me if I screamed. It's very dark. And it scared me forever. I mean, it really scared me to the end of my wits. And if anything was going to drive me insane, it was going to be that. Uh, what happens is uh, when you're falling asleep that you'll get an electrical shock through your body just as you're falling asleep. And uh, that indeed, that's the usual indication that you're going to have a visit that night. Um, then you'll fall, asleep, you'll fall asleep and then you'll wake up and you're totally paralyzed, you can't move. Um, and there's static in the room and uh, you're being visited, they'll circle your bed and uh, now and again they'll try and touch you. The first one is a uh, generic uh, shadow person, uh, which is just basically an outline of me and you. Uh, on a sunny day on the side on, on the pavement on the sidewalk uh, in a 3d form and the second um, the second entity which uh, is the hat man uh, who seems to have a direct link to him um, he's he's a very authoritarian figure um, he's very menacing it's uh, very he, he's in charge of them uh, his minions, so to speak, and um, their, their team is hell. He's awful, awful, awful. But it all starts with that electrical shock. I have my two separate lives. I have my life, like, we're here talking about it, and it's, you know, it's cool, and I go to work. And then when I go to bed, I have this whole other life that I have to deal with. When it first started, it was pretty intermittent. It wasn't every day. Don't know the age, around this time. Um, my brother didn't live with us anymore, and I had my room all to myself now. And it's kind of funny, because I can remember my bed had collapsed onto a box of Beanie Babies that my mom collected. My mom was a big collector. And so my bed kind of pivots, right? On top of this thing, there's a frame and the bed pivoting. And uh, I remember the bed was pivoted 
in this particular night uh, with my feet closer to the ground and my head higher up like a seesaw. And I remember the paralysis starts and I can see the door frame. Like I can see like, uh, I'm looking directly at, you know, I'm looking at a wall and the door is right here. So here's a bed, this is me, bam. Uh, straight forward, there's a door that exits, right? And there's the light from the hallway. And I remember seeing, you know, your traditional darkness, your, you know, everything kind of exists in shadows. I mean, all, it all looks like it's moving. All the darkness looks alive. But I remember seeing people, beings, whatever, uh, just coming in. They just, they look, they look like a, if a person were to walk in front of a light and their shadow were to follow them, they looked like an almost more shadow-like version of a shadow, like, and, and kind of just didn't do anything. Like, I remember now um, that they would, they just, shadows moving in, like, they would kind of intersect the light. I, I actually, I remember this kind of well now because I was on this weird tilt. So it wasn't just me looking up or, like, being able to kind of see around. This is me looking straight at the door. And just seeing these things, um, I remember in the process, I thought that they were real. And I always think they're real. Even to this day, I think these things are real in some sense. Um, but when I woke up, they weren't there. It was definitely the first time uh, that I saw something that made me think that this was more than just uh, a sleep disorder. I do remember it happening as far back as when I was a little girl, um, as far back as maybe five or six years old. And then the same thing happened when I was about 15. During that time, I was a rebellious teenager, so I was really out of control and feeling like unloved and stuff. I don't know how I got that way, um, but it was kind of like a brokenness inside. Like I was just broken, spiritually broken. And that time I was in a two-story home in Torrance, the city of Torrance. It was in the middle of the night, but I was wide awake. Like I was literally wide awake, my eyes were open. I could now feel this presence, this evil presence behind me. Lying on my side, like on my left side, I'm a side sleeper. Um, and then the door is behind me. And, um, and then I could feel the presence just right behind me. And I remember just trying to, wanting to move and turn around, but I could not lift a finger. Again, it was, I was just frozen, utterly in terror. And it was the, if I could describe what death would feel like, and it's a kind of horror that is worse than like in the movies. Um, it's, it's an icy, cold, kind of dark, evil, something's in the room and it's watching me that's the scary part that it's you feel a sense that it's watching you and it's and it's and it's making you feel afraid and it wants you to feel afraid uh, 
it was a year and a half old probably. And um, I, I was born and raised in rural Vermont um, in an old farmhouse, about a hundred, hundred plus years old. And I was in the middle of the woods. Um, so it was very dark and very quiet, uh, just pitch silence, which, you know, itself kind of has a sound. Um, and uh, so here I am, I'm a baby. I wake up and I can't move. Um, I'm in my crib and, uh, you know, so I'm surrounded by the bars of the crib on all sides. And above me, uh, at the end of the crib, before the window, um, are two anthropomorphic kind of beings, I guess. Uh, best uh, word to describe them. Uh, I still remember them vividly because it's actually my first memory. Um, so in a way, it's uh, kind of my awakening into the world. Dark. They always just look so cartoony. Mm -hmm. I've tried to draw them before and it just looks like so goofy. <laughs> it just doesn't have the same uh, malevolent impact. And um, their skin um, was uh, like television static. Um, you know, it had, you know, like an old, an old TV when the signals, uh, when you're not getting a good signal, it had that same kind of texture, that kind of ch They were, um, tall, kind of thin, these kind of thin limbs and these long, uh, fingers. And they had uh, these very simple faces, almost cartoonish faces, and uh, you know these two inky eyes and this big, big inky smile on their face. This kind of you know, it's tickling, tickling, tickling fingers. These like long, slender. They were laughing, you know. And then here's my little feet, you know. <laughs> they were tickling me. Couldn't. You know, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move and I couldn't stop them. And they were laughing about it. There was kind of like laughter, like, ha ha ha, like there, you know. And bars, these two anthropomorphic things, the windows. You know, according to my parents, um, but uh, I kept on repeating the word zines like Z-I-N-E-S over and over again in like kind of a panic like kind of like <laughs> signs, signs, signs you know like hanging on to them and so maybe as a a child you know seeing these kind of anthropomorphic sort of not human but human uh so I wouldn't sleep in my crib again um my parents uh, tried to put me in my crib and I just wouldn't do it. I would just scream and scream and scream and scream and scream. Uh, I made this as a Halloween costume uh, some years ago. <laughs> now you're, you're staring into my childhood right now. I don't know, was it scary? Did you seek any medical help? No, because I didn't think I was going crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew what I was experiencing was real. Um, and I didn't want someone else to come and tell me, well, no, that's not real. Did you seek any kind of help? Did you try to do anything <laughs> to keep it from happening? Did I get an exorcist? Mm -hmm. No, I did a Google search. I got on the internet very early uh, compared to most people in about 94, maybe. I'm totally guessing 94, 95. And one of the very first things I looked up was the shadow man and nightmare. And from there in the search engines, it wasn't very far down the page, sleep paralysis. I was like, wait, sleep? Frozen sleep paralysis. And I called my mom up right away. I said, oh my gosh, mom, it's sleep paralysis. That's what they call it. It's a thing. <laughs> she was very excited too. And she wanted to understand more about it because she felt that maybe something medical could be done so that we no longer had it. 
because when the scientists figure it out, they figure out a medicine to go with it, right? So we felt that we would actually have answers and medication or something to make it better. I called the doctor and made an appointment and came in and explained to them what was going on and my doctor said that she was kind of concerned that maybe I was having seizures while I was sleeping and so she set me up for like a CAT scan, and EEG and all that. So I went in for those and my results for the CAT scan were normal but the EEG came back with said um I had abnormal results. That's all she said. You have some abnormal readings. You have sleep paralysis. It's just caused by stress. So if you just make some lifestyle changes, it'll go away. Well, you get a cut and paste answer from doctors. Uh, you're stressed, uh, change your lifestyle um, without asking what your lifestyle is. There's no answer. It's just a dismissal of basically they don't know. And if they don't know, then they don't, they don't care. Uh, every time I would talk to like a psychiatrist, I'd be like, I'm having this sleep problem. Like, this is what happens, this is what it feels like. They'd be like, okay, okay. Tell me about like, you know, your, how are you doing at home? And I would always try to be like, no, 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 let's talk about this hideous sleep problem I have. She seemed really interested. She was like, leans in and she's like, and it's not sleep apnea. And I was like, I know that. And she, she just said, that's really messed up. I remember like the like the following night after it would happen I'd I'd lay in bed being so scared that it was going to happen again and then most assuredly it would happen again cuz I was thinking about it mm -hmm. and obsessing about it like when I'd go through like the dry spells basically where I wasn't having it if I started telling somebody about it then it was like almost 100% guarantee that I was going to have it that night This is an our college apartment. Okay. So I was here. I had my bed right here. And then my roommate was right here. And the blobs, I saw these black blobs I could see them, blobs of black, coming onto my bed. And I could see my roommate just in the corner over there, and I was trying to scream her name so that she could help me. And she's sleeping away, and I'm straining to talk, and nothing can come out. I'm a diver, and uh, I've experienced, well, I've been close to death quite a few times deep diver but nothing is as terrifying as what happens and I have it once or twice a week. When I was about 10 is when it started to happen every single solitary day of my life. Nobody ever really took me entirely seriously you know um, even though I was a petrified little boy you know terrified to be alone hated my bedroom hated the room below my bedroom and had sleep paralysis probably every night. Um, you know, had voices talking to me in the sleep paralysis, very abusive experiences. A forest. A forest. A forest. Who just won um, the giant insect of the month club? Insect of the month club. We're sending your first prize up to your bedroom right now. It, you know, it again goes back to the fact that, you know, because it wasn't like a real experience, if somebody had come into my bedroom 
and some creepy guy was whispering to me every night, you know, my parents would definitely have done something about it. But the farthest they went was um, kind of being like, well, maybe we should take him to a psychologist. No. I was trying to fall asleep. I felt this like overwhelming pressure come over me. And uh, my breathing just stopped. My body uh, was trying to kind of tell me, I'm going to kill myself now. And you have the option to stop that. If I want to continue to breathe, I have to actively override whatever else is going on. Uh, I have two options. Either try to break free of the paralysis, or um, I breathe. You know, that was, that was kind of the beginning. And that was the beginning of me being afraid of not going to sleep, but, you know, I would just pressure myself to wait till exhaustion to fall asleep for the most part because uh, after that it, it just never stopped um, kind of ever you know I'll get it just about anywhere uh, some places will be much worse and the voice is different by place Um, I, had, I had an apartment in uh, Boston. I lived in Jamaica Plain in Boston for a while above a pizza place. And I would always hear this middle-aged woman singing in a baby's voice there. Like, la, 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 like diddly dong, diddly dong. And this gradually faded away until I pretty much almost forgot I had ever experienced it. And I thought I was good, finally over. It was just a phase I was going through, and now it's done. One afternoon I was up doing housework and was kind of tired and I figured I'll lay down and take a nap because I'm going to go with some friends later on tonight. So I went, laid down and set the alarm on my phone, checked all the time, and just like kind of threw it on the nightstand next to me and just laid down and as I started to fall asleep I had felt like this tingling sensation come over me. And since I had been dealing with it so long, it was kind of like a familiar feeling. It's like the warning sign, okay, sleep paralysis is about to happen. I would get like, my body would tingle, start to feel heavy. I'd see just like all these pixelated colors. And so I sat myself up to wake myself up, kind of shake it off. And so then it felt like it went away. And so I just like, you know, looked at the, picked up my phone, looked at the time, okay. Laid back down and started going to sleep. And just as I fell asleep, my phone rang. And so I laid there for a second. It's like, do I answer, don't I answer it? Just fell asleep and now somebody's waking me up. So finally I gave in and I answered it. I grabbed my phone, hello. When I did that, the person on the other end of the line said, Hello, and then they said something else that I couldn't really make out because it was all staticky and cutting out. And so I said, I can't understand you. You're breaking up. There's a bad connection. And I said, Hello again. And it's like, You're breaking up. I can't like, hear you. And so finally, I trying to make out what they were saying and whatnot, and I decided, uh, I'm up. I'm going to go get a cigarette. You know, So I got up talking to him like, hello, hello. And then finally, you know, I walked out into the living room. And just as I got out in the living room, it became, the connection cleared up and the person on the other end was just like this very pleasant man. And he was like, hello, I, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. What kind of favor? Let me in. Freaked out, you know, I was like, there's a demon on the other end of my phone. I I want nothing to do with this. So I threw my phone across the room and it broke in pieces. And then everything around me just like went into complete chaos. It was just like, almost like an earthquake hit. It's like everything was shaking and dark. And 
my whole body started vibrating and felt like something was trying to like rip me out of myself kind of like pull my soul out you know just like trying to process this like what's what's going on you know i'm just absolutely terrified and so i the only thing I could think to do is I just started praying and you know, I was like, God, if you're there, help me. You know, I don't know what's happening. Just please, somebody help me. And as soon as I said that, it felt like somebody just grabbed me from behind, and just like yanked me back, like down the hall, and just like slammed me back into my body. And like I hit my body and I like sat up instantly and like looked around and was like, did that just happen? What? <laughs> Was that real? And so the first thing I did was grab my phone, you know, and like look it through, okay, who did I just talk to? And like, no, there was no missed calls or no answered calls or nothing. And I had looked at the time and it had only been like two minutes since I had initially laid down to go to sleep. Um, I did tell my mom and she just kind of told me I'm nuts. It's like, it was a bad dream. It happens all the time. I like, no, mom, <laughs> it wasn't a dream. <laughs> seventh or eighth grade, uh, 87 or 88. And I saw Nightmare on Elm Street with my mother, thank goodness, um, on cable. And she was like, oh my gosh, this, this is like our dream. I was like, yeah, I know. So we, we definitely agreed on that. And I kept watching it because I wanted to find some clues, some answer to what was going on. And of course, they mention a little bit of myth in the movie, but not enough to really research. Did you ever read about the Balinese way of dreaming? No. They got this whole system they call dream skills. They get all their art and literature from dreams. Just wake up and write it down. Dream skills. Well, what if they meet a monster in their dreams? Then what? When I was, uh, you know, we had HBO when I was little and my dad was very liberal with letting us watch whatever we wanted to watch on HBO. Once he was watching a movie and I, and I, I just kind of like wandered in and I didn't really know what the movie was. And, uh, and then this uh, creature emerges from behind a, a dresser and it's like, it's an alien. And it's like the, it was the movie Communion with, um, the guy who was in the dancing video. I don't know. But Christopher Walken. Yeah, exactly. Um, Christopher Walken. And um, when I saw that face, uh, my mind immediately drew a parallel to the things I had experienced as a child. And I was petrified. I remember just being petrified. And um, and then, you know, I, but I like, stayed watching as this like, little kid. And, uh, you know, and these images I like remember, it's incredibly shocking images to me as a child because it was the first time that the kind of things that I had seen aligned with something that, that was known about or was explored. A bunch of people came over and they're like, oh, let's watch this Insidious movie. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, I don't care. And like, about like 20, like 20 minutes into the movie, I'm like, yeah, this is about sleep paralysis, I'm pretty sure. I was like, all right, like, that's kind of cool. Somebody made a horror movie about it. When, you know, the dude's, like, in the chair, he just goes into this, like, world, and he's searching for the kid. They're pulling from so many different parts of Sleep Paralysis lore. The, the Shadow Man. I kept leaving my body. The, the night hack, the old hat. I sat there and like just kind of getting annoyed. I, I mean, I don't even know why. Like, it wasn't like this movie sucks. I mean, it was, it was, it was okay. And then all of a sudden they do like the head shaking thing, like this like weird, um, you know, it was in Jacob's Ladder and uh, it freaked me out. Like, I was like, that's exactly how it feels. Like, and that was the first time I ever 
uh, I saw somebody represent what it feels like, or I guess not what it feels like, or what it feels like it looks like to be in it. Like when I'm coming out, like sometimes my jaw will like just fucking go back and forth real quick, or like my head will like shoot from side to side. And it's what I imagine it looks like. Um, even my, my girlfriend, uh, she, she was like, you know, those weird head movements, like that's kind of like what it's, what it's like for me to watch. You know, except not magically blurry. That's a sleep paralysis day. It's got to be. Yeah, you know, I had my own sleep paralysis episode, and well, in that one, it was sort of a, a classic three-dimensional black shadow man who came up from the woods behind my house and leaned over my bed. Um, and I think maybe a year or two later, I saw Natural Born Killers, and there's a scene, and it goes by just in a flash, where that guy is like in the opening credits coming through um, like this strange red tunnel cloudy vortex thing. Um, I think it, I think it's over the credit producer Arnon Milchen. <laughs> but like it, it went by in a flash and it must have been, you know, kind of complicated to call into existence. So I was like, why was that there? And, you know, I still didn't know what sleep paralysis was. I, di I didn't know that anyone else had had it. So I saw that and almost kind of took it as a message. Like, <laughs> the people who made this film had the same experience that I did. <laughs> and it's kind of like a signal to me in some, in, in some strange, scary way. Oh, it's true. I mean, it was kind of the same as a child. It was very validating. I never thought it was my mind playing tricks on me. I just knew something bad was always happening to me. And I, I didn't, I didn't know what to do about it. I've prayed my whole life. I still pray. I'm a very spiritual person. However, prayer never made it go away. Even when I was within the attack, I would pray within the attack and still no help. I started exercising, started eating better, cut back on caffeine and doing all that kind of stuff. And just no matter what I did though, it was, had absolutely no effect on the sleep paralysis and it just kept happening like night after night after night. I finally decided to go to one of these ladies that week cards and she says, I can't look into your house. I'm trying to look into your house, but uh, I see this black shadow over it. So I thought I was abducted by aliens for a long time. Years, years and years and years. Before I went to bed every night, I would lay in my bed and close my eyes and just pray, um, not tonight, not tonight, not tonight, not tonight, not tonight, not tonight, not tonight. And I would just repeat it over and over and over in my head as if I had some kind of psychic bond with my alien abductors <laughs> and that I could communicate with them telepathically and just plead with them to make tonight not the night that they would come back and do that. Over the years, I would find um, different mechanisms to avoid sleep paralysis. I noticed that uh, it wouldn't happen every night if certain requirements were met. Like, like if I would, uh, like there would be like a TV in my room, and if I left it on, it was uh, for some reason it was easier for me not to to get hit by the paralysis, and you know, younger me thought it was like maybe that little high-pitched noise TVs make when you leave them on, and so I would leave it on overnight on mute uh, for that little high-pitched noise. Um, eventually that stopped working after about a year. So I decided like, you know what, if one TV worked, what about two? And I used to like collect junk, so TVs were like a plentiful, and two worked for a little while. And um, I just sort of escalated with that for a while, because I, I'm pretty smart, apparently. Um, no, it made me look like a crazy person until one day I realized that even if this was a problem, this was not the functional way of like dealing with it. So I just, I removed all the TVs at that point from my room and you know, all it did was leave me with a much stronger and more elaborate sleep paralysis. Uh, and, and that's kind of the thing that I've realized is if you have it every day, and you have multiple episodes a day, it will kind of learn how to adapt to you. Like if you try to like avoid it, it will find you and it will it will make it happen somehow.
And um, another time, I actually felt it go on the bed. You know, it was as if it's climbing up. I was laying there, and it came here. I just closed my eyes. And it was on top of me, and it was, it's like I was having sex with this thing. And I said, oh my God, this is, this can't be real. This can't be real. This demonic thing, and I don't know what, why am I feeling this? What else is gonna happen next? But it happened. Did you see anything? I didn't see anything. It was just the feeling. And then it was gone again. A lot of firsts all happened in one night. When the pain started happening, the hallucinations got more vivid and I started to be able to be interacted with. I go directly into this very you know, lucid dream. I remember it's uh, the architecture of this world or this dream. Like it was just very angular and I'm just kind of walking around. There were like stairs that went down to places that they should have thought out a little bit better. As I'm walking around, I remember um, a kid that I was friends with growing up uh, in elementary school, my only friend from elementary school, he comes up to me, his name was Danny. And behind him is this gigantic dude with um, really crazy orange hair. And Danny says, this is him. Uh, can I go now? And he just leaves the guy with me. And he, he repeats, you know who I am. I start thinking of like, well, I don't know you. I, I, I don't. I start listing places. Do I know you from school? Um, do I know you from McDonald's? Because I used to work at McDonald's. Uh, do I remember you from the Comic Book Depot, which was the, my comic book store? And he just keeps on going, um, no, but you know who I am. One last time, and then the entire world just disappears, and I'm in the strongest sleep paralysis episode I've ever had in my life. Like, I cannot move, like, I can't even try to force myself out of it. Like, that little wiggle room I get sometimes just wasn't there. And it felt like I was completely constrained, um, you yeah, know, fully, to the point where I'm just trying to breathe because I, I don't know what else to do. Immediately after that dream drops and everything's gone, he kind of fizzles away. And this is the first experience with pain. If I had to describe it, picture like a claw machine game. You know, three, three little things. And that's when the pain starts coming. The worst one is when it's around like, you know, by, you know, fucking dick. <laughs> And I still felt the pain after I woke up. I did not go back to sleep that night. I remember, and I think I just played video games until the morning and kind of questioned my existence. Like, I, I just remember being like, and this is different now, and now it hurts, and now there's a dude talking to me, and like, I, that was kind of when I started to feel a little crazy. Like, I started to feel like something was definitely wrong. Was it me? Maybe. Was it something supernatural? Maybe. I immediately stopped being an atheist. And sometimes they're very um, articulate, like that one was when I was like a little boy. And they'll be like, oh, I can talk to you and I know your name. And 
and this and that. And sometimes they're just like um, gobbledygooking, just blah, blah, blah. Like they don't have the capability to speak anymore. When I was older and I went back um, to the house and was staying there, I mean, I hated going back to that house. You know, I had other bad experiences there. And so I, I hated going back there. I hated sleeping there. I would usually, if I go back there and visit, I leave the TV on because it's just such a, an overwhelming force. So I fell asleep and I had this nightmare. And then I woke up and then I woke up in a sleep paralysis. And I was like, oh, you know, but I was so put off by the dream that I wasn't immediately shocked by the state of sleep paralysis, which normally is what it does. And I could kind of see out of the corner of my eyes that there was this man standing down at the end of my bed, kind of like a slumpy like old man. Mm, looks too young for some reason. Maybe it's his posture. And uh, and I'm like, huh? I'm just kind of like, oh, that's weird. So I'm laying there, and uh, there's this man down at the end of the bed, and uh, and he says to me, he says, Forrest, you just came all over your mother. sheets. You just masturbated all, all over your mother's bed sheets. You disgusting, a pervert. I had not masturbated that night, I will say, <laughs> but this voice was immediately familiar as the voice that had talked to me when I was a child. The same voice. It was like, um, it was like as if, uh, you know, you get a phone call from a relative or somebody you haven't talked to in a while, run into an old friend and uh, hear their voice first and you recognize the voice. It's, you haven't heard it in a long time, but you know it, it's that person. And when I had that experience, I'm like, oh, it's that voice. That, Man. I've seen him like two or three more times in that physical incarnation, but I've also had like times where I've seen people that have approached me the same way, and I felt like, yes, that's him. Like I, like, it was a different body, but it was that same entity that was talking to me. We had a friend staying over. Like we had, we had like people over that night, and we had like a one-bedroom tiny apartment. So like we were all like kind of crammed into my bed. <laughs> and uh, I remember I had um, gone to sleep. You know, the two girls, they were they were asleep. You know, they were they were out like a light. Almost immediately the paralysis hits. Normal paralysis, completely normal. You know, situation like stereotypical dark room. Uh, but in this, there's a, a really tall entity like you know, if the room is eight feet tall, he is an eight foot tall dude with a hunch. Like, he's not fitting in this room. Uh, and there were red eyes. This is what I remember. And, you know, like, very Mothman type shit, actually. And it starts talking to me. He repeats, you know who I am. You know who I am. You don't know who I am right now. But I know you, and you know me. I just had this horrible experience, you know, and, you know, I believed it. I believed that this thing was telling me I was, it was going to kill me. I'm going to die. And I'm sitting here feeling bad for her that she's freaking out. And I'm, I'm trying to calm her down. I figured out she has, I figured she had a sleep terror or something like that. And she's telling me that on her chest, she saw something on her chest, like a cat with red eyes. And it was looking at me, talking in a language that she couldn't understand. Like it was on top of her, but threatening me. And the second she said it had red eyes, I just like fucking freaked out. Like I was just, I like. <laughs> I remember this was during a time in my life where I was like, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe you know it's fine. And then this happened, and then it immediately affirmed I thought I was gonna be dead. Like I just I was like, oh, I'm I'm going to die, and like shit like that immediately makes me want to be like, fuck like regular life. Like sorry about the language. When things like that happen, it's very hard for me to be like. Yeah, I'm just gonna go get a normal job and like live my life. Like, I'm like, I wanna figure this out.
Any idea why it happens to you more than other people? I have no idea. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, it's all just presumption, but, you know, could assume that maybe it had something to do with being such a young child, you know, and having such a profound experience. You know, it's kind of like when you, when you uh, see something for the first time, you know what it is. You know, you go to a sea world and you see a killer whale and you've never seen it before. You know, now you know what a killer whale is. I read the very few websites out there about it and I didn't really learn anything new except for there is a chemical melatonin that goes into your system and is released upon sleep that is supposed to paralyze you. And I was like, okay, maybe this could be medical. Um, but again, there was ever, never an explanation for the shadow man except for hypnagogic hallucinations, which is a nice word that the doctors like to throw around, but it really means you just imagined it. My guess is we conceptualize things in our unconscious based on like snippets of information that we pick up along the road somehow. If I came from an evangelical community where they really believed in evil demons, maybe my, so my immediate association from my unconscious as I'm like rising out of sleep would have been like, oh shit, it's the devil. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, although I wonder if you look at your own reaction to, to your experience is similar in, in a different way. Yeah, ex no, you're absolutely right. Like, that's true. I'm like, of course, like also my unconscious is like, what is the scientific explanation for this? There must be a reason that has to do with logic. So yeah, of course I like leapt for that too. I can see it just as easily as like there's the commonality of like human experience and like how our brains and our hearts and like our personalities function. Like we're all people. Why wouldn't we see similar things? Like we're not different species. Why wouldn't we have similar go-to archetypes in our brain? It's so Jungian. But it can't entirely be born from you. You know, that's to say that everybody has in them the capability of bringing out these horrible things before they've even witnessed anything horrible. It's one of my theories that we're actually running our brain, we're kind of overclocking it, you know, more than we would when we're just sleeping or just awake. And that kind of heightened sense of perception, while we as humans can't really, um, we can't interpret it, like we're still not, you know, interpreting it right, but now we're seeing the raw data. We're seeing, you know, oh, that could be a demon. I don't know how to visualize a demon because that's not that's not a thing that my brain can can interpret. And I mean, I actually kind of believe that probably a lot of people who do believe that they have been abducted were actually victims of sleep paralysis of varying degrees. And of course, as reading more about sleep paralysis and reading, realizing the prevalence of this experience, you know. Uh, exist in every single culture in the world. There are these common archetypes that keep popping up and all over the world. Like it's not just in America people get these red-eyed demons and it's not, you know, they're everywhere, you know, the, the shadow man, the cats on the chest. A giant cat that would come into somebody's like house while they were sleeping and hold them down. It's like clawed, like teeth and claws, sometimes metal or like metal-ish. Yeah, there were the, the ones in Turkey. There was the ancient Morse or the ancient Norse one, like the Mara and there were just so many. The haint, like the haunt. Among immigrants who then subsequently, a lot of them uh, died, you know, from sleep paralysis. Right, right. And I know Wes Craven read an article about them and that helped inspire Nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger, which, you know, then went on to create a weird feedback loop, inspiring other people's nightmares and sleep paralysis experiences. So I had a dream um, about Freddy Krueger, and he obviously wanted to kill me, wanted to harm me, wanted to scare the crap out of me. And I believe that that fear creates a substance, and I got this black ink scared out of me, like an ink fish. And I believe that's what it eats. The physicist Michio Kaku said that maybe that we don't live in just one dimension, that we live in multiple dimensions. And if you imagine a block of flats that is an infinite uh, extension of itself, so it's 
it keeps adding to itself all the time and never stops. And every room of this uh, block of flats is an entire universe like ours. Now, in every other room, there must be another universe. So if that's true, maybe some other us have found our way into the hallway and are knocking on our door. Right after my mom died, I was very depressed. And so I'd be crying, you know. There was this one day I remember that I had a, a breakdown and I was crying a lot, a lot. And then the next day, since I worked night shift, I came home, slept, you know, to sleep. Um, and that for some reason that day, I wanted to sleep on my side. So I slept on my side facing the door of the, bed, of the bedroom. And all of a sudden I felt my body getting numb. I felt it getting paralyzed. And I said, oh my God, I'm getting this again. But then it felt different. I heard somebody walking. This presence came around and it came behind me. I was like this. It came behind me and it hugged me. And I heard the mattress depress also. I heard that depress, like someone went in the bed. And I felt it was my mother. And I heard her voice and she says, Honey, I'm here. I'm here. And it felt so different from that past presence because, you know, this was my mother. It didn't feel evil, it felt warm and I was happy. And I, felt, I, was, I would talk to her. It's like through my mind, I said, oh, mommy, it's you. Oh my God, I, you know, and she, she's hugging me tight, saying, I'm here, I'm here. And that was just a matter of seconds also, and then she was gone. So I really, you know, I think it's my mom that um, comes to visit us. Does that, ha does that still happen? It, it happened like two or three times, because even though I, feel it's her, there's a part of me that sometimes says, what if it's this thing? Um, because sometimes when I have felt her, all of a sudden then it kind of switches. And then I do feel like if there's another presence. And then I don't know if it's this thing again that used to haunt me back then, or if it is still her, even though it does feel different. I, I could tell the difference in both of them. And I have said, who are you? But of course, I don't get an answer. And then it just lasts a few seconds and it's gone. Okay, well, the one that stands out above all others um, happened one night when me and my girlfriend went to bed. And uh, it was around 10 o'clock and I went really tired. So I, I played on my phone for a bit and uh, had a game on the phone and I must have fallen asleep. When I woke up, I stood outside of my bed in a very oppressive atmosphere. Uh, I can't describe the atmosphere to you, unless you were there. I mean, it, it, I've never experienced it before, and I've never experienced it again like that. It's a kind of a very staticky, uh, just present presence of evil and as I turn to my left I see my girlfriend in bed and I see me in bed and now I'm confused but I also see my eyes open and then they heard myself laboured breathing which is what I do when I have a sleep paralysis attack I'm shot, scared and I don't know I, I, I don't know what, what's going on I'm confused more than anything 
I can't, I can't think straight, I don't know what's going on. And almost instantly, as I'm thinking that, I can see three beans over in this corner of the room. There's no looking me up and down and seeing who I am and what I'm doing there. They, the two generic shadow people advance on me straight away. A grapple ensued between me and them. I'd like say it was a, a noble fight that I had to really put my foot down and win, but it wasn't. They just retreated straight away that when I put resistance up behind the hat man and the hat man shielded them and I had no intention of going forward to, to investigate anymore. All I know is that I have to get back in bed. That's some sort of some voice in my head saying, and my own voice saying, get back in bed. And as I turned, I can see a long silver thread, for want of a better word, that's going up towards my body. And I decide that now I've got to get back into bed. And just as I decide that, I shoot up in bed. Uh, there's no in-between going back in my body or whatever. It's just, I'm there, I'm, I sit straight up. And I go downstairs into the kitchen, get a drink, and I'm instantly hit by the fear that and guilt that I've left her on the own upstairs. Because they're still in that room, I know they're still in that room. And as I go back upstairs, I sit in bed and I stay up all night. And it's like I'm on watch. They just wanted me really bad. I remember I was just sort of laying in my bed and then there's now a loud noise. And I, I hate the sound of the noise. It's like almost like, um, like spirits or demons, like kind of like screaming at you. Um, so then you hear like a, it's almost like a buzzing that starts and then I can sense a presence right, like standing over me, just standing right here next to me on my bed, standing over me. Then you hear like this sound. It's like, it feels like somebody's screaming right in your ear. Um, like they're right here and they're screaming. <laughs> And I can sense the color red, as if they were wearing something red, like a dark red robe of some kind, or something red. And I, tr I tried to look at the face, but I, I couldn't. Like every inch, every centimeter feels like oh, a ton. And so I'm trying to move and I want to see it and I'm looking, I'm like straining to look up, straining to look up. I, I could I, I could barely move my head. It was almost like going like this, like. Uh, um, and then I, I think I said something. I said, I just said, I remember this guy, his name is Jesus, and I'm gonna use his name right now. And I'm gonna say just in Jesus' name, you know, you get out or I said something to that effect. Jesus name, Jesus name, get out. And I, f I suddenly sensed that the demons or the, the thing that was happening to me, that evil presence just left, gone. Um, and it was amazing. It was like a feeling of victory, yeah. When they never came back? They never came back. I wasn't even a Christian then. I actually abhorred um, religion. I didn't want 
some lady a long time ago told me I should marry a Christian man and I just laughed in her face. Anyways, um, I learned very late in my life that the name of Jesus has power and that's how I became a Christian. So, um, does, do not, um, do not believe in the uh, Wikipedia definition of sleep paralysis? No, um, that would be sort of like the, I guess the, the worldly term, uh -huh. like what people would deem as something that's a physiological uh, response, that it's like a natural thing that happens with the body, but I don't think that's true. Um, I do think that it's um, something to do with the spiritual realm um, and it's closely tied with possibly demonic ap activity. At those three years old, I don't think it's going to get any better for me. Um, I've experienced it most of my life, if not all of my life. I know what it's like. I don't believe that this is just a rare occurrence. I think it's, I think no, none of us are special that have this happen to them. There's no reason why we should have this happen to us. So, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'd like to know how many other people out there uh, experience this. Uh, I know there are quite a few, but I think there's a lot more. Hey everybody, it's Connie here, AKA a Phoenix Rising 11. Thank you for joining me. Um, I first want to start out by saying that I'm about to tell you a very personal story and if you get weirded out easily or you're not that open-minded, um, So you made a I pretty powerful YouTube video about your experience. Do you watch a lot of other people's uh, sleep paralysis videos? I don't, I don't really like to listen. Um, I haven't seen a lot of other people's sleep paralysis um, mm -hmm. videos. Although people do send me their stuff, I, I just am not in a place to want to listen to that kind of stuff anymore. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just, it's like kind of like that's the past. Um, and I'm not in that space anymore. That I, you know, I found faith and I, I met my husband and I never thought I'd get married and. So you're actually trying not to think too much about sleep paralysis anymore yeah. despite. Yeah, I mean, why, yeah. for what, you know. Um, I was uh, dating a girl, it was pretty crazy. She was kind of like really into being very naturey, not like a hippie, but kind of like a crazy wood spirit nymph thing. <laughs> it was kind of her her vibe, you know, all her clothes were like stitched together. Like, <laughs> she was crazy. She would do things like say, uh, start walking out in the middle of an incredibly busy street and I would try and stop her and she'd be like, no, no, the spirits are guiding me. And she would have her eyes closed <laughs> and just stop. I can't believe she was survived. So she was definitely on the cusp of something. So was I. I mean, we were both really living in the fringes of sanity at that time. And uh, we went up to a cabin uh, that my dad has in the Bay of Fundy in Canada. And we were walking out in the woods and uh, it was getting dark and it was kind of dusk. So she um, said, Let, let's build a stone circle, you know, because we had just gone to a pebble beach. So we took our pebbles and we laid them all down. And then um, we decided to be receptive, you know, what that means. And uh, so she like closed her eyes. She was like standing like this. <laughs> and I was just kind of standing there like this. And uh, she goes like this, and suddenly she goes, oh, something's She's coming. coming. And, uh, coming. and she had her eyes closed. <laughs> and uh, so she was not, could not see anything. And I was looking. And it was like she was listening, and I was looking. And uh, I looked into the forest, and um, out came this uh, blue form. 
started approaching like this wavery blue thing. Like you know, the same quality of those black things that you talked about, but blue, blue, peaceful, just really like nice. And she's like, oh, it's, she's blue. She said she's blue. Um, eyes closed, you know, like this. <laughs> and it came and approached and then it just kind of stood still. And it was like maybe like six feet like over there. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this. And here's, here's my girlfriend and she's just like laughing a lot. Like, oh, she's saying such the funniest things. Like, just crazy. It was really crazy and weird. And she goes, oh, she says, she says not, not to be to worried about, about the demons, demons behind, behind you. you. <laughs> and, and I was like, what? And I like turned around. And I saw them. That same face, uh, the face that people see when they're abducted by aliens, the face that I saw as a, as a small child. And then in that moment, uh, I suddenly had this like um, kind of realization. Because it wasn't like linguistic, I didn't hear anybody talking to me, but I heard, like felt a thought in my head, something external, and it was all about how um, uh, fear empowers bad things. To have fear when you're in a bad environment or a bad place or around a bad thing only gives that thing more strength. What that kind of made me sort of begin to realize is that, you know, here I'm hearing these voices made of disembodied, confused, schizophrenic ghosts, you know. Um, yeah, those are people, maybe they're dead, maybe they're alive, maybe they're not, I don't know. But then the other things, the black cloudy thing, you know, these gray things, um, those are something more primal, something more just environmental. And when I kind of came to that realization, I'm like, well, why does it have to be any one thing? And shortly thereafter, the, the blue spirit uh, dissipated into the woods. And then um, we went back to, you know, the cabin, and that was that. You're talking about something that happens at the absolute edges of, like, dreaming. Like, you can't explain dreams. You can't explain them logically. They're all like little bits and pieces that come up from your unconsciousness and from like things that you've experienced and who knows how like the sleeping mind puts things together and now you're talking about an experience that happens like in that in-between stage. It's so liminal. You can't put logic onto liminal situations. I need you to also understand that I was in an abusive household. I believe because I was beaten so much during the day that at night my soul had to heal to keep me here. That's why I had to get through the fourth dimension. And that's why I had to go somewhere else to be healed so that I could come back and deal with my life. I knew absolutely nothing about sleep paralysis until I was told about it. And then I like almost instantly began experiencing it. I don't believe like the medical explanation to it, the physiological stuff just a sleep disorder, there's got to be way more to it. Like I told my one friend about it when I was just talking, I was like, have you ever heard of sleep paralysis? She's like, no, and so I kind of shared my experience. And then like the next day she texted me, she's like, I hate you, I hate you. Whatever you were telling me about happening to you, now it's starting to happen to me. Kind of like an STD, <laughs> leap transmitted disease. There was an experience during this time that I actually did think I died. Whole dream's going fine. I don't really know what we're doing. It lasts a long time. It's like one of those, you know, three, four day feeling type dreams. So I'm just kind of existing in it and sort of enjoying it. And all of a sudden, like somebody knocks at the door. It's like two homeless dudes. And they're trying to get in, and I'm trying to tell them that, like, listen, it's rack capacity. Rack capacity for homeless people in my weird dream town. 
There's a, a guy on rollerblades in the back. Very nice. And as I'm thinking about you, like, he turns and he starts rollerblading towards me. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like, he's going to come into play here. This is cool. Like, you know, I'm probably going to wake up soon because it's all evaporating. And as he gets really close, he just pulls out a gun. And then I'm in the paralysis. But it's not a paralysis I've ever felt before. It's just nothing. I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. I'm just nothing. So I guess maybe this is an afterlife. And I was like, nah, probably not. Maybe I'm in a coma. And I started to think, like, sleep paralysis probably finally fucked me. Like, I'm probably done. And I probably just stopped breathing. And this is what happens when it happens. Like, I'm just nothingness. And, like, five, ten minutes go by, and I'm just, like, get a little nervous, but, like, at the same time, I'm just kind of weirdly serene. Like, this sucks. And I remember thinking, like, I'm going to try to pull out of it. Like, the same motion I would do to pull out of sleep paralysis. I'm going to just try to emulate that. And I try over and over and over again. I mean, hundreds of times. You know, just like, but I'm, I'm getting somewhere. And I remember I come up for, like, half a second. And I can see my room. It's like I can open my eyes a little bit, but nothing's, there's nothing there anymore. And it's almost like I'm just in bed and the room is like, all the details of the room are gone. Where there's, you know, I can see my now ex-girlfriend's dresser or little vanity and there's nothing on it. And I remember I called out her name and nobody came and then I was back in the crowds. And then it was another, you know, five, five, 10 minutes of pulling out. And then eventually I woke up. And she wasn't there, nobody was around, but it, it just, it was, it was the worst. I just felt like I died. You know, it became this kind of turning point for me and, and you know, I just, I, how I saw all this. And I definitely didn't want that to happen ever again. So how did that change your, the, the way you saw all this? It just, it, whereas before I felt like I was maybe, you know, learning and exploring and it was like kind of fun, uh, it stopped being fun. Like, it's not like I get to, you know, like people talk about astral projection and all these like fucking awesome sounding things, like how they get to fly around and, and you know, I don't know, do cool things. And I don't get that. I don't get, you know, those, I just get these weird experiences where I feel like for a second, I can see something that most people can't. Like there's what we see in the world and right behind it, you know, almost like, it's like everything's cellophane wrapped or something. And for, for half a second that, that like wrapper's gone and I could see or perceive uh, something a little bit more real or whatever real is. Um, and then it's gone, but I can see it for that half a second. And so like, no matter what fear or pain comes along with it, I always get this experience where even if it's in my head, it's made something interesting. It's, it's something that I can pull from that makes my life uh, almost kind of worth it, you know, which is, you know, for a long time, something uh, you know, I don't feel like I've ever had. And it's, it's gonna probably just keep getting worse. And I truly believe that one day it will be the reason why, like, one day I don't wake up. And one day I'm just, you know, I don't breathe, I can't control the breathing, and it's done. And I feel terrible for whoever I'm dating or married to when that happens. Um, but I'm kind of ready for that now. Chris. Hey, Chris. You know, I'm ready for that to be, you know, just kind of what happens to me. Uh, but I would like to figure out a lot more about this uh, before that happens. And it's also made me feel very comfortable with the idea. Like, if something's happening that's more than I'm just crazy, then something's happening. 